Good evening, Chris, and thank you. And thank you at home for watching. Uh, I am in for Rachel, who's out tonight. We have a lot on this breaking news tonight here. The day after Star Wars actress and longtime mental health activist Carrie Fisher passed away at the age of 60. Her mother, as Chris was just reporting, actress Debbie Reynolds passed away at the age of 84. She is perhaps best known for her role as Kathy Selden in, of course, the acclaimed Singing in the Rain. She was just 19 in that role that first made her a star. She was nominated four times for a Golden Globe Award, notably for her role as the title character in the unsinkable Molly Brown. In addition to acting, she was a successful businesswoman and a humanitarian. We have some political news in the show tonight, but we want to begin with NBC's Gabe Gutierrez, who has more on this story. Tonight, as mourners gather at Carrie Fisher's memorial on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, well wishes are pouring in for her mother, Debbie Reynolds, who was rushed to the hospital. According to law enforcement sources, the 84-year-old was at her son's home in Beverly Hills when someone called 911 around 1 p.m. Engine 108 Rescue 78 stroke. This video from TMZ shows an ambulance leaving Reynolds' son's home this afternoon. Reynolds' career has spanned nearly seven decades. I'm there. Including some of the most iconic films of the 20th century. She's Hollywood royalty, the first wife of pop megastar Eddie Fisher, who divorced Reynolds to marry her best friend, Elizabeth Taylor. I don't choose well. I don't blame anybody but myself, but I just seem to have very poor taste in men. Singing in the Rain made her famous back in 1952. When we left casting the 19-year-old alongside song and dance veterans Gene Kelly and Donald O'Connor. They've been dancing 30 years. I was dancing for three months, so I was hysterical. Decades later, her daughter would become Princess Leia. Hours after Fisher's death Tuesday following a heart attack, Reynolds thanked fans for their support and condolences. I am grateful for your thoughts and prayers that are now guiding her to her next stop. Love Carrie's mother, she wrote on Facebook. NBC's Gabe Gutierrez there with a report on the passing of Debbie Reynolds here just a day after we have been reporting at Carrie Fisher's passing. And as so many fans of, of both of these actresses and leading ladies around the country reacting, we are going to get to some political news tonight. But first, in, in addition to that report we just aired, I want to go to our Los Angeles bureau where NBC News' Gotti Schwartz is also reporting the story. What can you tell us? Uh, well, we just spoke with Debbie Reynolds' agent, uh, Tom Markley. He has confirmed that Debbie Reynolds has passed away. In fact, he spoke uh, with uh, Debbie Reynolds' son a little bit earlier. Here's what he had to say. Uh, she has gone to be with Carrie now. Uh, she loved taking care of her, and now she's gone to be with her. Uh, the mother and the daughter is so famously close here in Hollywood. Uh, many people is showing their support right now online. But uh, obviously, Debbie Reynolds, one of the most uh, famous actresses of her time, uh, mother of Carrie Fisher, and when Carrie Fisher uh, was hospitalized, Carrie Fisher uh, passed away. It was a very, very difficult time uh, for Debbie Reynolds. She was obviously in mourning. We understand that she was taken to the hospital uh, because of shortness of breath, and now we can confirm uh, that she has passed away. Once again, her son saying uh, she has gone to be with Carrie now, and she loved taking care of her. Back to you. you. And you mentioned the family. Obviously, this must be quite a toll on them when, when you think about a, a mother and, and daughter dying a day apart. It, it absolutely is, but you also have to remember that this was a family that uh, was embracing of, of all their problems, all their tribulations, and they were also a, a family that seemed to uh, embrace the humor in it all. Uh, so uh, we saw that in a lot of the interviews uh, with Carrie Fisher. <clears throat> we also saw that in her mother. So uh, you have to imagine that both of them uh, right now may be finding solace in, in each other. NBC's Gotti Schwartz in Los Angeles. Thank you for your reporting. We appreciate it. Again, tonight we can confirm legendary, legendary actress Debbie Reynolds dying at the age of 84. We will update on the story uh, as we learn more. This happened uh, confirmed by NBC News just moments ago. We do turn back to politics. You are watching The Rachel Maddow Show. I'm Ari Melber in for Rachel. And it was exactly 16 years ago on this date, December 28, 2000, when Bill Clinton had 23 days left as president, and being the ambitious type on this day, he told folks he was still working on one thing to do before leaving office, and that was peace in the Middle East. Clearly, that's a topic that tends to arise at the end of some administrations, and on this day in 2000, it wasn't going well. A final push in the last weeks of Clinton's presidency. 
But Clinton's demand that Israel and the Palestinians agree in principle to his peace proposal hits a wall. At the White House today, <laughs> President Clinton clearly frustrated. We're all operating under a deadline. It's just some of us know what our deadline is. Both sides know exactly what I mean and they know exactly what they still have to do. Now, that December, there was also a president-elect, of course, and that day, George W. Bush was announcing his pick for Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld. Reporters gathering there asked about then-President Clinton's Mideast effort. Here's how Bush used his voice to discuss America's voice on the world stage. Would you push the Palestinians and Israelis at this point to include a peace treaty, or would you allow the status quo? And do you favor this Clinton plan, which in effect calls for a de facto division of Jerusalem? We have one president, and we'll have one president, and uh, the current president is President Clinton. And our nation must speak with one voice, and therefore uh, his is the voice that needs to speak. Having said that, I will tell you, I'm, in, I'm impressed by his efforts to bring the folks together. Obviously, we hope it works. We hope it works. Now, Bill Clinton's last-minute peace deal did not work, and the Bush administration didn't get much further on that front. Eight years later, when Barack Obama was president-elect and he was asked about the Middle East, Israel was three days into a ground invasion of Gaza. With the situation in Gaza, I've been getting briefed every day. Uh, I've had consistent conversations with uh, members of the current administration about what's taking place. Uh, that will continue. Uh, I will continue to insist that when it comes to foreign affairs, it is particularly important to adhere to the principle of one president at a time, because there are delicate negotiations taking place right now, and we can't have uh, two voices uh, coming out of uh, the United States uh, when you have so much at stake. You can see the simple pattern here, a long bipartisan tradition, especially on foreign affairs, where presidents-elect tend to stay out of the fray because it could be confusing and in some cases even literally dangerous for the U.S. to have two foreign policies appearing to happen at once. And even on matters not as dire as war in the Middle East, presidents-elect have generally respected this unwritten rule. Clinton was a study in transition today, attending a meeting on the state budget, reading briefing books on how to set up a national government. One of Clinton's first problems may be an escalating trade war with Europe. The U.S. just raised tariffs on some European products 200 percent. I don't want to comment on it. I'll review it. I, we got one president. He has to make those decisions. I don't want to get in the way. Bill Clinton there staying out of George H.W. Bush's way, just as Bush's son would later stay out of his way, just as, yes, Barack Obama would stay out of George W. Bush's way, and on it went. So it is that long history that makes the actions from the current president-elect over the last several days so completely unusual. Past presidents-elect have declined even to offer an opinion on the outgoing administration's foreign policy. But Donald Trump has gone further than that after the Israeli government contacted the president-elect's team to ask for help in blocking a U.N. resolution on Israeli settlements. The president-elect publicly called on the Obama administration to veto the resolution in a statement nearly identical to the one issued by Israel's government. Trump also spoke directly with the president of Egypt, which had sponsored that resolution, a, a direct interference, obviously. The U.N. vote even was briefly canceled, and for a moment it appeared Perhaps the president-elect was scuttling a U.N. resolution against the wishes of a sitting American president. Now, that is a big deal on process, regardless of how you feel about the individual resolution. Now, the vote did happen. The U.S. abstained. That infuriated the Israeli government. And the president-elect took to Twitter to say this, quote, we cannot continue to let Israel be treated with such total disdain and disrespect. They used to have a great friend in the U.S., but not anymore. The beginning of the end was the horrible Iran deal. And now, this U.N., stay strong, Israel. January 20th is fast approaching. Secretary of State John Kerry, who is still right now America's top diplomat, and he will be so until January 20th, responded directly to the president-elect's tweets today in an interview with NBC's Andrea Mitchell. I think there are limits to what the, the, uh, the uh, administration can undertake at this point in time. We understand that. But I'm not going to get into a debate with the president-elect uh, on, you know, Twitter or whatever. It's just not, uh, I'm not going to do that. There's plenty of time afterwards uh, when Is they are confusing? governing. When... Is it confusing allies and adversaries? Um, I think it's having some impact, obviously, on allies who are questioning uh, 
they know what's going on, but they have their own policies. You know, they're not going to be swayed and intimidated by a tweet. They're going to pursue their interests and their their own values, and that's how, what diplomacy is all about. They're not going to be intimidated by a Trump tweet. John Kerry is actually telegraphing a lot in that new response. He's waving off Trump's tweets as so much digital piffle. And he's saying that neither the current administration or serious allies are going to take Trump's typed out slogans very seriously. It's more than a rebuttal. It's kind of a philosophical and strategic choice about how to deal with Trump's Twitter alter ego. And it might come all the way from the top. Because on the day that Twitter Trump was kvetching and complaining about Obama's approach to the transition, the president took time from his Hawaii holiday vacation and called actual Trump. Then Donald Trump announced that call before the White House, telling reporters today, this was around 5 o'clock Eastern, that he'd spoken with President Obama. He phoned me. We had a very nice conversation. We had a very general conversation. Very, very nice. Appreciate it that he called. There's a tradition of some circumspection about these discussions, but after Trump, as you saw there, announced it, about a half hour later, the White House released their official statement saying, quote, this morning from Hawaii, President Obama phoned President-elect Trump. Today's call, like the others since the election, was positive and focused on continuing a smooth and effective transition. The president and the president-elect committed to staying in touch over the next several weeks and agreed their respective teams would continue to work together to effectuate a smooth transition of power on January 20th. Now, that's official speak, but it's Obama's way of saying, pay no attention to the man behind the Twitter machine. We're good. And tonight, we can tell you that worked. After whatever Obama said on that private call, Trump rushed out to tell the world it was, quote, very, very nice. So the two sides of this same phone call coming out pretty similar. The only other side to this call is, of course, Twitter Trump. The man you just saw with your own eyes coming out and saying this is all very, very nice and he appreciates Obama's transition call and work. He was talking tough on Twitter today, just this morning, apparently upset that Obama had suggested that he could have beaten Trump if they'd been able to face off against each other. Trump was tweeting, quote, doing my best to disregard the many inflammatory President O statements and roadblocks. Thought it was going to be a smooth transition. Not now, once you take a moment to get over the fact that our incoming president is making a not joke, that's Wayne's world, I'm not even sure he did it correctly, then you might wonder, what does he mean that it wasn't a smooth transition, especially when he is saying out loud, not on Twitter, the opposite. The custom is we have one president at a time. And when you see Donald Trump come out, like he did just tonight, and sound that way, you get the feeling that custom is actually alive and well. But that's just some of the time. On Twitter, unchaperoned and shouting out into the world and to the UN and to the Israelis, if Donald Trump hasn't been recently soothed by his newfound, perhaps, mentor, President Obama, there are again suddenly two presidents at a time.